Okay, this is W5HRO. Here's that uh, AM uh, homebrew transmitter I uh, built back in the early 90s and had on the air. I, uh, I started gathering parts for it sometime in the uh, late 80s, mid to late 80s, and I had it all assembled and ready to go by uh, the early 90s, probably like 92, 93. This is the one that used to be broad as a barn because the, uh, the negative peak when I modulated would go way too far negative, so I never could turn the, uh, the speech amplifier up too far. I had to keep it turned down and keep it from splattering too bad. It was like 20 kcs wide when I did. But it was the wrong kind of splatter, you know? It was like, wow. But it sounded beautiful. Anyway, uh, the original design, I actually found my notes. They were in a folder, and envelope and look there's the dimensions when I put this when I designed this thing back in the 80s there it is there's how I wired this the uh the high voltage and everything and the power the AC coming from the wall and and there's the uh the bias supply that I made for the uh the 4400 CG and then there was the loading cap arrangement I used for the uh the loading here there's the loading, the verbal loading cap down here, and then there's the uh, the switch for it. And uh, it's got all Peter Dahl transformers. It's got a modified custom wound. It's custom wound for eight tens to this uh, tube here. <laughs> the CG, the carbon graphite version of the, the 4400. It has more power dissipation, but uh, it's custom wound for the voltage I'm running and that tube to modulate it. And there's the driver, it's the uh, KW1 driver transformer or the uh, desk kilowatt, Johnson desk kilowatts, exact same transformer. And uh, there's the uh, the plate transformers I have. There's actually two supplies in this transmitter. There's uh, one for the modulator and one for the RF and they're both capable of 800 milliamps. <laughs> it's overkill, but hey, you know, can you say continuous, continuous duty times infinity or something? And there's the uh, swinging chokes, see? I don't have a regulation problem at all. 30 to 5 Henry, 1 amp chokes. Perfect. So anyway, but I have all the documentation of how I originally did this. Now, I moved out here to California uh, in the Bay Area in 2000, January of 2000. And this thing sat in storage until 2009 when I got a U-Haul truck and my, my ex-wife and I drove it out here in a big U-Haul with all my other stuff. And uh, they went to my our house in San Jose that I just sold here recently. Uh, just, I mean, into February 2020 here. I got out just, I got top dollar for it just before the market crashed. And, and if you want to know where I am now, I'm in El Dorado County, California. And I will be on the air soon. <laughs> Back on the air. It's been like, I've had like a 20-year dormancy. I got on the air with some small, you know, low-power stuff in San Jose, you know, a time or two. But I really have not been active since uh, the end of 1999. That's how long it's been. It's been 20 years. So anyway, uh, I was going to actually do this last weekend. But I went out in the garage and started looking. And I can't find the cord that I wanted. I thought I had a longer one. This has got a all big heavy duty, some type of like dryer power cable on steroids. It's set up for 220. It's one of those industrial power cables. And uh, it's too big and I'm gonna rewire. I don't have 220 here in the shack. I only have 110 and I'm not gonna put 220 down here anytime soon. I am eventually gonna build a 4-1000 linear amplifier. And when I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and put the 220 in the shack. Then I might consider redoing this back to 220, but I'm gonna rewire this for 110. The problem is I was searching out in the garage and I went through all the boxes and that's the exact size power cable that I want. Problem is it's too darn short. I wanna be able to roll this thing like over here if I want to and have it still plugged in if I need to work on it. But that's the right size and I'm gonna to have to change out the uh, the thing here, the, the adapter here for the, the cabinet, 
that di the uh, the diameter of that's too wide off the if, even if I screw the screws down all the way it'll still it still won't probably clamp on this skinnier power cable. I'll probably have to go to Home Depot and find a heavy duty power cable and just like an extension cord the heaviest shortest the heaviest one they make and just cut the other end off and use that. But there's the uh, swinging chokes, and there's the KWS-1 plate transformers in the back. All the iron in this thing is was Peter Dahl custom, back from the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, except for, like, two, there's a couple on the bias supply deck that's a, that are Hammond. And there's one little one that I added up in here when, I'm, when I did this recent change to it a few years ago in the RF deck. But it's all Peter Dahl iron. And I'm just going to rewire those plate transformers for the uh, for the 110 input here. As soon as I can get a power cable for it. I thought I was going to be done already, but I can't find it. I thought I had one, but I don't. But anyway, this is the bias supply deck for the 4400. And that's going away. That's going away. I'm going to have the T368 exciter with the sideband adapter next to it. The SB10 adapter. The, the, just the chassis, not the front panel of it. There's the SB10. I'm actually going to make it to where I can run this, you know, with the uh, T368 uh, excitation. And I'm going to grid modulate the 4400. And that's one of the modifications I made to this thing a few years ago. And I just need to finish it up. I'm going to put a light here. This used to be an input tuning for, I, I'm going to, I've got, I'm changing the input tuning on this thing because it doesn't really need it because the T368 exciter, it's the way these things ran in the T368 is it had a short piece of coax driving the uh, the grid directly. As long as it, the coax, the piece of coax is short enough, it wasn't an issue. I can even put some of those ferrites over it, you know, just to keep any RF, and it, it worked beautiful that way. But uh, the thing about these T368 exciters is that when you spin the knob, well, it tunes the circuits as it's, it, it moves everything around the resist. I mean, the capacitance and the inductance and all that stuff. So it, uh, it's auto tuned uh, just by changing the frequency. So it does, I don't need to tune it. I won't need to tune it. It'll just be fixed there at the input. So anyway, but this, what, what this is, is I forget which position is which, but one position's the relays off and it's an AM. It's going to have grid leak bias. That's the change that I made. It has a grid leak resistor in there now that's going through the current meter and all that stuff. And then when I go here, it's going to switch it to AB bias. It's going to switch. It's going to force a supply voltage on to it externally. And that's how I'm doing this. And that's going to have, I'm going to have one of those big round old fashioned lights there to where it just, when I go to sideband, it lights up so I know it's on the AB position. I just need an indicator to make sure that, that if it's, I'm going to run it on AM, that's not, the light's not on. That's the that's that's how I'll detect whether it's in the right position or not. But there's the 810, you know, um, 810 rack down there. I've got a big current meter on it, and uh, here's the the speech amp, and this this adjusts the uh, bias for the uh, the. I'm using six A3 drivers, not two A3s, but the six volt version, six A3s, which are the same thing as six B4G. So they have produce a beautiful sound. They're low mu triodes. So anyway, but that's what I'm doing. I'm just going to go through and I'm going to, as soon as I can get to find a power cable, I'm mad I would have had this done already. But oh, here's also the, uh, is the, uh, the three diode negative peak limiter with the new and improved modified problem solving double resistor circuit. Do not, do not use one resistor like everybody's been doing. There's a reason why you don't want to do that. There's a, there's a flaw in the circuit design. And if when you add the extra resistor, it bridges it over at the right sequence of events so the, the event doesn't happen that's created without it. And basically what you do is these two resistor, resistors in parallel, because they're, they're all when the negative peak's going down, it's going to see both of these resistors essentially in parallel. So they're going to divide, right? So you've got to have, say like, say like you needed a, a 10K, resi 10K load for this whole circuit to work. Well, you got to put two 20Ks in parallel like this. They're not in parallel, but they're in parallel the way they're going to, the way when the negative peak goes down, and that's what's important. So that's a big, humongous, significant improvement, improvement in that limiter design. There is a flaw in the initial circuit, and people just don't know it's there. I discovered it, and it's real. And uh, it causes additional splatter on the bands. I guarantee you it does. It needs to be corrected, and that's how you fix it.
I'll uh, I'll probably uh, post some. I'll probably do an article, and I'll put that on w5hro.com when I have a chance. That that that's gonna gonna be a future article that I need to rewrite and put it on there. Try to explain people why it needs to be done, and you know, that it's it's in, it's important. So anyway, this is a this is pretty cool now. I can't wait to get this thing relit up again. Uh, where did I put the? Uh, oh, I have the uh, the bottom panel for it's in here, and see, I have a fan, and it's gonna it forces air. It sucks air out. From, it sucks air from the outside and forces it up at the base of the tube. It's just a muffin fan, and this thing here mounts inside the chassis on the bottom side. It's, it, it directs it so it forces most of the air on, onto the tube socket. Because I'm not using a forced air-cooled socket. This thing had been in a, it had been pretty much in a, a you know, Class E configuration and it's running just low power AM, you know, car I mean, not low power, the thing will do like 500 watts, but carrier. But still, it's not, the tube's just sitting there loafing in Class C service. So it wasn't really a problem, but when I read when I when I redid that change and I made that round piece of PVC that mounts up in there, you could actually reach up here and you could feel the air coming out of these holes now just a little bit. So finally, that that's it gave us some circulation before the fan was just blowing air and it wasn't coming out the holes. It was dividing off all throughout the bottom of the chassis. So I had to like focus it on the bottom of the socket and that seemed like it uh, solved the problem. Cause I'm just using one of the old ceramic uh, tube sockets with the old clips on top of the chassis to hold the tube down and you know, make contact with the, uh, the chassis. So it should work when I get this thing fired up. I'm gonna go yay and at night with the lights turned out and you'll see that the thing will be lit up orange and when I modulate, when you see the yay, you'll see it brighten up. And that's the whole point. <laughs> Gotta have that yay in, yay in phone. If I can say it right, yay in, yay M. That's the problem, it seems like the older I get, the the more I have, the more the more trouble I have getting, getting uh, words out correctly. I think there's a name for that, isn't there? Uh-oh. <laughs> anyway, that's it for now, I think. Uh, did I have anything else to add? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've had two videos on my old YouTube page. If I get my finger out of the way of the camera here. Uh, I've had two videos, which were the bias rework. When I when I added the relays and I did the bias, because the way I had this circuit, that was I had regulated supplies. They were too stiff. I, I wanted some flex in them, but the way they came out, they were just too stiff uh, for the tube. And I know why, because it was designed for a pair of 4400s and not a single one. So I had ex the transformers were supplying extra current, and I just, the values didn't come out right, so it was too stiff. So when I'd modulate, it forced the negative peak down too far. Plus, on the, uh, the transformer, I, there was two taps, and I used the one at, which produced the, the the smallest secondary voltage for the screen. And I had the screen running only at 400 volts. Well, you know what? Whenever whenever I used to run this thing years ago, the grid drive had to be a little bit higher, but the screen current always the screen current always ran 10 milliamps too hot. It's because the screen voltage was too low, and I didn't realize I was on the wrong tap on that. Uh, on that uh, primary on that transformer, and that's what happened. So I did visually switch that, and it came up to the full 500 volts because this tube, this is a this is not like it's not like the iMac 4400 uh, A tube or this carbon tube even. The uh, the specs on it, where is it? It's uh, it's uh, it's 500 volts. See, or where is it? No, it's 600 volts. No, it's wait a minute. I'm looking for Class C service. Here we go. Yeah, there it is. 500 volts right there. Amplitude modulated carrier conditions below 75 megacycles. I love it when you see MC and not megahertz. <laughs> anyway, DC screen voltage 500, DC grid voltage 200. And I've got it to where, yeah, that's that's where it is. With the grid leak, I've got an 18K grid leak resistor, I believe. Now for the control grid, and that's how it's going to work. And then when I switch it, it's going to be a different bias for the, to put an AB for the uh, sideband excitation. 
So I'll, uh, like I said, you're going to see, but when I did the original bias supply, I, uh, I was doing the rework on this thing, like I said, in San Jose, and there's two videos that have been on YouTube. If I can finally get this story to come out, uh, there's two videos that are on YouTube that I've had on there when I, back when I did that rework that I've just almost have completely finished. It was almost completely done. And uh, I'm going to make this video part one because this is going to be, this is kind of like, hey, this is what this was about. You know, this is the uh, the homebrew transmitter. This is part one. But I'm going to put those two old videos, I'm going to make them part two and part three because, hey, we got to, you know, I got to get to where this whole series makes sense. And then as I get this thing powered up, start doing more, there's going to be like a part, you know, part four, part five, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It'll continue till I get this thing on the air and back in service. So this is W5HRO.